than anybody else uh, for the next several weeks in, in the sense that this has been a, a, a real enlightening time in my own personal Bible study to understand this chapter. I've had several problems with it, uh, wavered many times over what the verses are actually pointing out and what they're getting to, and I do believe in the study that I'm seeing it more and more, and since I'm learning this new for myself, uh, when I'm preaching it to you, I'm just confirming it down into my, my soul myself, so uh, I'm glad to be part of the preaching uh, service today and, and be preached to while I listen to myself. Uh, now, the, the second thing is, is as we go through chapter 4, uh, we're going to dissect this chapter. If, if this is a chapter that I haven't understood that well, and now it's starting to fall together, it falls together because of, of how precise the Apostle Paul is teaching this. And I, I don't know any other way other than to spend several weeks on it and let it uh, outline itself, not just give you an outline and, and just pass it over, but, but actually watch how he is developing his statements so that we understand the chapter together. And so we'll, we'll spend a few weeks, and you just be patient to do that. Um, we, we've been studying for several weeks already, chapter 4, but the first six verses, which we already had some knowledge of, and that is that, that our, our endeavor now that we are saved, our worthy walk before the Lord, is to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And there are seven unities that are given to us in verses 4 through 6, which the Holy Spirit has created in the age of grace, which covers everything from the formation to the body of Christ and the activity of the Holy Spirit within us, the hope of how we're all going to be caught up together in heaven, how we're all to follow the, the leadership, the headship of Jesus Christ, our Lord, uh, that we have one canon of Scripture that's been given to us, and, and primarily the epistles of Paul that are our instruction for faith today. Uh, we've all been baptized into one body, but not just members one of another, but also members of Christ himself. And as a member of Christ, we're all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, and there's one God and Father of us all, and uh, he's in all, he's through all, he's above all. And as we, we consider all that, it's said in verse 7, and we studied last time, we, we actually looked at verses 7 through uh, 10 there, but we really didn't get all the information out of it. We had kind of just had to end, and I told you at the end, you'll have to come back next week, which I was away last week, so it's been two weeks ago. But verse 7 says, but unto every one of us is grace given, is, uh, is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that de ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Let's stop and pray. Father, we pray that we'll look at this passage and, and begin to see the truth that the Apostle Paul is telling us about the ascended Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us that becomes our sufficiency and grace even to this very day. In his blessed name we pray, amen. I'm going to go over the information that we, we studied last time, and if you weren't here, you can actually get a tape of it and, and find the verses, and we looked at the verses of some things that are said here, but, but what we did, we picked up in verse 7 after defining the unities of the Spirit, and, and we noticed right away that it said, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And, and the, the but is an exception. And, and when I looked at that, I was puzzled right from the beginning of what is Paul saying, but? Uh, what, what did he say that there needs to be an exception to or, or uh, uh, some kind of clause like that? And my thinking went all the way back to another thing that troubled me, and that is in verse 1 of chapter 4, where it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And realizing my unworthiness before the Lord, and that's what grace is all about, I've always find it very difficult that when the Bible instructs me to walk worthy, to ever think that I can. And, uh, and, and I really couldn't, in my own power, ever walk worthy of the vocation, the new life that God has given me in Christ. And then I begin to understand that, that that's what verse 7 is talking about when it says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. 
Uh, God gives us not only the grace that saves us in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, but he gives us the grace that su- makes us sufficient for everything that he calls us to do. Uh, someone once said that the, 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 the will of God will never lead you where the grace of God can't keep you. And, and that's absolutely true. God never called on us to do something that he hasn't equipped us to do. And if he tells us in verse 1 to walk worthy, then he's going to equip us by his grace to do so. And that grace that we have from him is according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now that measure of the gift of Christ ought to immediately take your mind all the way back to the cross of Calvary and realize that what the Apostle Paul is saying, that the work of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary was not only sufficient to save you from the penalty of your sins, it was sufficient to, to empower you in your Christian walk. And the measure of the gift of Christ is unmeasurable. It, it, it will reach, it will be sufficient for anything that God calls us to do. And what he goes on to explain in verses 8, 9, 10 is what Jesus Christ has accomplished in, in, in the gift that he has given to us, in the cross work that he has worked for us by dying on the cross for our sins and being buried and ra- raising again. That's why it says in verse 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now I said to you in our scripture reading, that's Psalms, 100, that's Psalms 68 verse 18. Uh, in, in a flavor that the Apostle Paul is using it. Paul is not saying that, that Psalm 68, 18 is fulfilled today in us. He is saying, he's taking the words of Psalm 68, 18 and, and taking that and telling us that Jesus Christ has accomplished something in our behalf to make us sufficient to walk worthy of the, of the vocation wherewith he has called us for. And, and so he says, wherefore he saith, and that is concerning the measure of Christ, in the fact that the gift of Christ has accomplished something, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. The ascension of Christ was after his death, burial, and resurrection. He walked 40 days on this earth, and then he ascended up into heaven. But what we'll see even more, more than that is when he ascended up on high, he is now in the far above all heavens. And from that exalted, ascended position... He done some things that helps you and I live the Christian life today. Those things are called he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. And, and so those are the two things here that we begin to understand is what is equipping us to, to serve the Lord. Now he gives us some detail in verses 9 and 10 concerning what Jesus Christ accomplished. He says, now he that ascended. What is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Now, the Apostle Paul is giving us some information here that that apparently we need to be students of God's word to figure out what is it that's being accomplished. The ascension of Christ, the last thing he does, he talks about the ascension of Christ in verse 8, But in verse 10, when he talks about the ascension of Christ, he says, far above all heavens. So what he does in this parenthesis is he tells us that Jesus Christ descended. But how far did he descend? To the lower parts of the earth. Then he points out to the ascension of Christ, and how far did he ascend? Far above all heavens. He went to the lowest point of of earth, to the highest point of heaven. And from that highest point of heaven, we know that he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. And that means something for you and I, Christian life. And and that's why it's important for us to study it and figure out what those things mean. Well, so we spent last time talking about how he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. And there is an expression in your Bible, the lower parts of the earth, that could mean that he came down to this very earth, uh, came out of heaven when you think that he left the heavens and he left the the presence of God in heaven, and he came down to earth. Anywhere on this earth is the lower part. Uh, He came down to the earth, and and you could just speak about the land as being the lower parts of the earth. But we also realize that that is used in a Bible in in another sense, that when you look at it with spiritual eyes, you begin to realize he didn't just descend onto the earth on the land, but he did even more than that. He descended even further into the lower parts of the earth, as the Bible talks about, in the heart of the earth. And so last time we were together, we talked about how far Jesus Christ came down from the heaven of heavens 
and he came down to earth, and on, when he was on the earth, the Bible talks about his humility in, in going to the cross and dying on the cross for our sins. He lowered himself. But he did more than just lower himself in humility. The Bible went ahead, and we started looking at verses that talked about that when Jesus Christ died, that he told the, the thief on the cross next to him that that day he would be with him in paradise. We also know, we studied some scriptures and saw that there was, in, in, the, in the heart of the earth, or in the earth, there was uh, the promise that Jesus Christ said that, that as Jonah was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Meaning that when Jesus Christ died and he went to paradise, paradise was in the heart of the earth. And he spent three days and three nights there, and then he was risen from the dead spent another 40 days on the earth before he sent it up into heaven. So we know the Lord Jesus Christ, went when after he died, he went into the heart of the earth. We also looked and studied some things about what was inside the heart of the earth. You know, in your Bible, the whole place of departed spirits is called Hades. You read about it in the Old Testament that way. It's translated hell. Now, sometimes we think hell is, is only a place of torment, but, but the hell that's, that's, the, that's a place of Hades is a place of departed spirits. Uh, it, David said, and you'll, you'll remember the Psalms, it's quoted about the Lord, but David said about himself first, Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, neither shall suffer thy holy one to see corruption. That, that speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ, that when he died, he went to hell. But he told the thief on the cross that he's going to paradise. Well, we looked over in Luke chapter 16 last time, and we saw that inside the heart of the earth, there's two places. In Luke 16, there's a rich man who died, and he opened up his eyes in torment. There was a poor man named Lazarus, and he was in a place called Abraham's bosom, a place of rest. And there was a great gulf between the two where one who's in torment can't get to the place of paradise, and the one who's in paradise who would dare try to bring water to those who are in torment can't if they, could, if they would try. They can't, they can't bridge the gulf. There was a gulf there. So when we studied this passage of Scripture last time, we got that far, and we realized that, that he went that, that distance. Not only did he come down to earth, he apparently went into the very heart of earth itself, into a place that was called paradise. Now, he that descended is the same also that ascended. How far? Far above all heavens. And that's why we got the heavens of heavens. By the way, these little things here, you know what they are, don't you? Let's hear it. Birds. Okay, good. I'm an artist. I'm going for it. <laughs> okay, those are birds. These are stars. <laughs> I don't know. They look pretty good to me. <laughs> Gertrude and Heathcliff. Uh, there's heaven. That's where the birds fly. And actually, I could have made it around the earth, but I thought if I did that, I'd put heaven with torment, and that wouldn't look too good, so I put it up here. The heaven where the bird flies. Then there's heavens plural in your Bible that speak about the stars where our planets and all are. But then the Bible talks about the heaven of heavens. We talked in Sunday school how Solomon said, behold, the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. So there's a heaven above the heavens. It's the heaven of heavens. And that little throne over there, that's the throne of God. And, and that's where God dwells. God dwells in the heaven of heavens, or at least that's the, where his presence is made known, as, as Solomon tells us. He fills all heaven and earth. His presence is from the heaven of heavens down to the lowest hell. You can't get away from the presence of God. But when Jesus Christ, the Bible said, not only did he descend to the lowest part, but he ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. When we hit that last time, if you were just now checking in with us on the study of the book of Ephesians, when it talks about the church, the body of Christ, which what who you and I are today, the reason that God has formed the church, the body of Christ, is, according to Ephesians 1, that he might fill all things. Now we know that Jesus Christ not only descended to the lower parts of the earth, but he ascended far above all heavens. Why? That he might fill all things. Meaning, he ascended to this point so that he could create the body of Christ for his eternal purpose of filling not only the earth with the nation of Israel, but to fill the heavens with you and I, who are members today of the body of Christ. We're not God's spiritual Jews. We're Gentiles or Jews who have trusted in Christ and made part of the body of Christ for God's purpose to fill the heavens. So he descended this far with this purpose in mind, and now he is there far above all heavens. 
Now, in that position, far above all heavens, he is able to do something for you and I that's going to make us be sufficient to walk worthily before him. What is he able to do? Well, according to what the verses said, he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts to men. Now, first of all, let me just tell you what the gifts to men are, because that's the easy part. Look down in verse 11. He gives us this parenthesis about how far, how low he went and how far up he went. And then in verse 11 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Well, when we're talking here about how we're, we can walk sufficiently or, or have sufficiency to walk worthy before the Lord, well, he's given us grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. What was the gift of Christ? He came and died. He ascended into the lower parts of the earth, or descended into the lower parts of the earth. He ascended far above all heavens, and from the far above all heavens, he gave one of the things, he gave gifts to men. He gave us apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why? So you can walk worthily before the Lord. He didn't just ascend back into heaven and leave you all to yourself to try to live the Christian life worthily before him. No, from that position, one of the things he did, he gave gifts to men, and we'll, as we get down to that passage, we'll study what he did and how those gifts work for you to benefit you to walk worthy before the Lord, actually, to erase all excuses not to serve the Lord the way he called us to serve him, because he's made us sufficient. He didn't ask us to do something he hasn't empowered us to do. We'll get to that. But before we get to the gifts, he did two things, didn't he? When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So we're stuck with that phrase now, he led captivity captive. What did he do there for me to help me live for him today when it says he led captivity captive? Well, I've worked on that phrase several times trying to figure out exactly what it means, and there's really two ideas that people... Well, one that people have taught me, and then one that I, I think I've come to understand, which, which I've wrestled for a long time to understand, just that phrase. See, the phrase itself, I have a hard time with. You know, the Bible talks about it in Ephesians. We'll get to this one where it talks about the washing of water by the word. How many of you have washed water? Washing of water. <laughs> well, you realize you've got to think about what that phrase means. That phrase means something, and you've got to work on what that phrase means. Well, he led captivity captive. What does that mean? Does that mean he led good people to a place of captivity? Did he lead bad people to jail? Who, who, he led captivity captive. And I, I, I sit there and just think all the time on what those words mean, captivity. Is that a person or is that a place? And he led them captive. Well, did he lead them to a place or did he, did he bind them some, somehow? Uh, and so I begin to work on those phrases, and you begin to realize it, it, it gets a little tough. But, but here's the two thoughts. First of all, the reason we pointed ab about the dissension of Christ is some see real clearly here is that when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, meaning that when we read about his death into the lower parts of the earth, he said he was going to where? Paradise. Now watch this. Hold your place in Ephesians. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And it is, it, it is interesting. It's from this far above all heavens, Jesus Christ is now calling the Apostle Paul and giving him his revelation of the mystery of the body of Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you have to read a little bit before you understand Paul's talking about himself, but he talks about himself in a third person because not, he's not bragging about himself as a person, he's bragging about who God made him in Christ. And so he says this, 2 Corinthians 12:1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now, the Apostle Paul, he's not one of the twelve apostles. The, if I could just point out to you, in case you don't know this, that God had twelve apostles, and the purpose of the twelve apostles is their, their ministry and their message is about a kingdom that's going to be set up on the earth in Israel, 
and that through the nation of Israel, God is going to bless the earth. He's going to bring a kingdom down to earth. And that's their message was all about the kingdom. And that's why the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You know what that kingdom is called? It's called the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a kingdom of heaven is going to come down to earth and reign. And when Jesus Christ came out of heaven and walked on this earth, you know what they were proclaiming? The good news that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. That's the message of the 12 apostles. It's about what God is going to put on this earth, his kingdom on this earth. That God's not putting his kingdom on this earth today. God has postponed the kingdom. He's called the apostle Paul from afar above all heavens and revealed to him new truths about the body of Christ and you and I having a place in heaven. And, and this is one of those passages. Paul says that, it's, it, that he'll doubtlessly come to visions and revelations of the Lord. What the Lord revealed to the twelve apostles is not the truths that God has for you and I in the age of grace. Ours comes through the apostle Paul and Paul was getting them little by little. And he's telling the Corinthians, look, you better be followers of me as I am of Christ because he's the one, he's the apostle to the Gentiles, he's the one with God's word to us. So as he talks about how he comes to visions and revelations, look what he says in verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one, uh, such a one, caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how he was caught up into, where? Paradise. And heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will glory, Yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. And he talks about because he's had so many revelations of God, God gave him an infirmity in the flesh to keep him humble. That's when you begin to understand that Paul, when he says, I knew a man, he's talking about himself. But he's not bragging about him as a person. He's talking about how the position of Paul the apostle that was given visions and revelations for you and I to know. When he was given visions and revelations, 14 years before he wrote this epistle, he said he was caught up into the third heaven. Did you read that in verse 2? But when you read in verse 3, he says, and I, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how he was caught up into paradise. All of a sudden, we know when Jesus Christ died, he descended into the lower parts of the earth, and he called it paradise. Now all of a sudden, now that he's far above all heavens, he calls the Apostle Paul not into the first heaven, not into the second heaven, but where? Into the third heaven, to the very presence of Jesus Christ. And he saw things that were unspeakable for him to utter, but he received visions and revelations about God's purpose for the body of Christ in the heavenly places. But Paul says when he got caught up into the third heaven, he was in paradise. Apparently, paradise is no longer in the heart of the earth. Paradise was a place where people were, the souls of men were taken and, and, and we could say kept captive in the heart of the earth. Those who were re believers in, in, in the truth of God, those who were God's people were kept in a place called paradise. The non-believers were in a place of torment waiting to be cast later on into the lake of fire. But when Jesus Christ descended in the lower parts of the earth, he also ascended far above all heavens. And the next time you read about paradise, it's up here in the third heavens. As if he led captivity captive. He took those who were in captivity in the heart of the earth, paradise, and brought it up into the third heavens. And he led captivity captive. He took these people and put them up there. And you know that matches your Bible? When you read in the book of Revelation, out in the future when God's wrath is poured out, there's going to be martyrdom. People are going to be beheaded for the witness of Christ. And you know when you read about them in the Bible, when they die, they're standing, they're before God in heaven, they're under the altar in, in the presence of God in the holy temple in heaven, and they're saying, how long until you avenge my, our blood upon these people who killed us? And he says, not until the wrath's over, not until the end. Well, my point to you is later on in the book of Revelation, when people die, they don't go down in the heart of the earth anymore. They, they're, they're shown to be up in heaven, in a, in a, not in a body, but as a soul and a spirit 
in heaven waiting for resurrection day that comes at the second coming of Christ for them. Now, it's interesting to me as well, Paul, when he says he was caught up, you know, he keeps saying, he says it twice, and I, I think this is comforting for us. He says, whether in the body or out of the body, I can't tell. Now, we played with this in Sunday school and realized there was a time 14 years before this, Paul was stoned and left for dead. And so we could speculate and say he was out of the body. His soul and spirit left the body because he was stoned, bleeding right there on the ground, and, and, and then he, he went up into heaven. But if Paul doesn't know, I don't think you and I could say we know. So we just we don't speculate either way. But you know what the truth is that I think God would have us to know? Is that when you experience physical death, you won't even know it. You realize someday you're going to be walking along and you're going to keel over dead and you're going to be in glory. And you're going to say, am I in the body or out of the body? I can't tell. That's exactly what you're going to say. Because uh, Jason, I think, asked me last time, you know, when you talk about a soul and it talks about a tongue, about the man in hell, dip your finger in, in, tongue, uh, uh, in water and cool my tongue, you realize your soul has a tongue. That guy didn't have his body there. He has a tongue. He has a soul. He told the other guy, dip your finger. That guy has a finger. You realize your soul looks just like your body, only it can go through things because it's not physical. So when you go out of your body, you won't know. You'll think you're just the same as you were, only your body is going to be left behind. You know, that takes a lot of fear of death away, don't it? Uh, and I believe that's why that's there. But come over with me while we're talking about death to chapter 8 of this of 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 8. We, we've not, we're seeing that ca the paradise and those who die are now in heaven. It's chapter 5, excuse me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And here, another verification of that. Paul tells us what, how, what we can expect between death and resurrection. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, For we know, now there's no guesswork about these things, Paul says we know, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were, dis were, were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. When something is not made with hands, it's not physical. It's God, God's got a spiritual body for us. That verse says, if this earthly house, you know what I am? I'm a soul, and I live in a turtle shell. It's my body. This is the shell that I live in. And, and this body is the house of my earthly tabernacle. I, I, I live on this planet Earth, and as long as I live in this planet Earth, I need to live inside this body because it helps me get around on planet Earth. It's pretty hard to get around without it. And so what he's saying here is if our earthly house, speaking about our body, of this tabernacle, the place we live, were dissolved, <laughs> that's what you put it in the ground, that's exactly what's going to happen to it, it's going to decay, we have a building, a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. God's got a new body for us that he's going to give us, it's in the heavens right now. It says, for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Oh, don't you want to put on a glorified body? Don't you, don't you want to walk in a new body that can float and go into space and travel into the heavens and come down to the earth? And the Bible says we're going to have a body fashioned like under the glorious body of the Lord Jesus Christ. He rose bodily from the dead. It's a body, but it's a different kind of body that we have now. And Paul says, boy, we groan for that. All the aches and pains gone. Just, just a glorified body with no more pain, no more suffering, and no more limitations. No more sin, no more temptations. He says, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Now, that is, we groan to have our glorified body. We're going to get that at the rapture. But what we don't want is a time of nakedness. You know what time of nakedness is? If the rapture is 10 years from today, maybe we got that wrong, I don't know. <laughs> if the rapture was 10 years from today, and you were to die today, you'd be present with the Lord, we'll see the verse, and, but you won't be in a body because you don't get a body until the rapture. So you're going to be out of body. Whether in the body, out of the body, I can't tell. But out of the body, Paul says you're naked. I mean, your, your, your soul isn't clothed with a body. So he says we don't groan to be found naked. You know, your hope is the rapture. Your hope is not physical death. You're not to look forward to physical death. You're to look forward to Christ coming and receiving a glorified body. It says in verse 4, for, if, uh, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not that we should be unclothed, 
but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also shall have given us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Where's Jesus Christ? <laughs> Far above all heaven. While we're down here in a body, we're, we're absent from the Lord. But look what he says. For we walk by faith and not by sight. This is how we know these things. It's by faith, not by sight. Verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You know what happens when you die? You leave the body, but where do you go? Far above all heavens, you go to be with the Lord. Paradise is up here now. The dead, dead saints in Christ are no longer in the heart of the earth. They're up here in the presence of God in the heavens. And so some have speculated, and it does seem to fit, I've been taught this, that led captivity captive, meaning he took the souls that were here and he led them into to paradise, into the heavens, and, and then gave gifts unto men for the formation of the body of Christ for you and I to grow. So that, that sounds pretty good, although I don't believe that's what lead captivity captive means. Now, I shared all that with you, and I still have time to tell you what I think it means, but I shared that with you because it could mean that. We just got done with Sunday school, and for years I talked about what it meant about blinking, and Tom Schuler shared a different idea, and the whole chapter seems to say exactly what Tom said, and not the way I taught it. So I, I'm not the Lord. I just teach Scripture. I study it and do my best to teach it the way I see it and, and try to use the context and let the Bible interpret itself, but I fail. Now, people taught me this is what led captivity captive meant. My problem is, working on that phrase, led captivity captive, I can't tell if that's good. Why would you take someone, led captivity, captive? Doesn't it captive sound like a bad guy? Doesn't captive sound like something you don't want to be? Uh, when, I, when I read that phrase, I, I can't quite get uh, a real joyful thing there. It, to me, it's almost the negative of that. And, and, you know, you have two places, by the way, in the Bible that uses that phrase. You've got it in the book of Judges where uh, uh, Deborah and Bart. Bart? Bart. Not Simpson, but Bart. <laughs> Bart, uh, he, he, the, he was fighting a battle, and, and, and Deborah has got a song of Deborah about, about the battle, and so it's a whole poetical song, and she tells Bart, Arise and lead captivity captive. Well, I read that, I can't figure out what she's telling the guy. <laughs> the other place is in Psalm 68, 18. I go over there to try to figure out that, and you heard it read to you in the scripture reading. It's so full of figurative language, you can't figure out if it's good or bad. So I, I really have troubles, but I began to work on things and begin to, to have this understanding of what the phrase, just the phrase itself, led captivity captive, could mean. It, it, it probably means to lead those captured into captivity. Now, now, now work on the thoughts here. To lead the prisoners to imprisonment. It, it, it means to conquer and to carry away the enemy. Now, you have examples of that kind of actions all the way in, all through your Bible, is that when you go into a land and you conquer the enemy and you lead him away from that land, you know what comes to that land? Peace. That's how you, that's how you bring peace to the land. You go in, you conquer the enemy, and you lead him away so that peace can be there. Peace can be brought into the land. The nation of Israel, when you talk about captivity... The whole book of, of the Old Testament is all about the nation of Israel going into captivity in time past under Nebuchadnezzar. And you know what he did? He went, he sent his armies in, they conquered the promised land from Israel, and they took Israel captive and led them away in their captivity. He took them off the land and dispersed them throughout the, the, the nation of Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon, and took them out of the land. Why? So that he could control that land, so he can have put his reign on that land, and they can't retaliate because now they're spread out throughout the other nations. He led captivity captive. Well, that doesn't quite sound the same. It doesn't sound so positive. It sounds like you're going in and spoiling an enemy and leading them away. And I believe that's exactly what Psalm 68 is saying. Go back there now. Because what Paul did in the book of Ephesians is he took a spiritual truth, or he, excuse me, he took a physical truth about the second coming of Jesus Christ to the nation of Israel, 
and is saying that Jesus Christ has spiritually accomplished something for you and I in, the, uh, in creating uh, you and I as members of the body of Christ for a, a spiritual place, the heavenly places. For instance, when you come to Psalm 68, David is not at all talking about the formation of the body of Christ. David is here predicting about the kingdom coming to the earth. Psalm 68, look at the first five verses. It says, let God arise. Can you look at the chart? When God, when God was dealing with the nation of Israel, it says he ascended into the heavens and sat at the right hand of God the Father. Until his enemies are made his footstool, then he's going to stand and judge the, the earth and return and set up his kingdom on the earth. Remember the parentheses of the age of grace? This time period wasn't known. We're studying about Jesus Christ. He sat at the right hand of the Father until his enemies are made his footstool. He's going to judge them in his wrath and return to reign over them. Look at how this verse begins. Let God arise. Why? What's going to happen when he arises? Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish from the presence of God. You know, he's going to rise to lead captivity. He's going to judge the enemy, and there's fire and melting. There's, this wrath is what's being described when Jesus Christ stands up. Wrath was supposed to come, and he was going to take the enemy out of the land of Israel and set the kingdom up there with Israel. Look at verse 5. Uh, uh, verse 4 says, Sing unto God, sing praises unto him, extol him that rideth upon the heavens. See where he's at? Second heavens. By his name Jah, and that's abbreviation of Jehovah, God, Jehovah who saves, uh, the Lord who saves. It says, and, and rejoice before him, a father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. This is God coming to judge and avenge the earth of those who've taken advantage of the fatherless and, to the, and of the widows. He's going to come back and set his kingdom up on the earth. How's he going to do that? <laughs> the enemies are going to be scattered. He's going to leave them away, captive. You know, when you read through this psalm, now watch this, verse 11. The Lord gave the word, great was the, the company of those that published it. Jesus Christ in his second coming comes forth out with a sword out of his mouth, the word of God. He's coming to judge. Kings of armies did flee a piece, a pe a, a pace, and she that tarried at home divided the spoil. You know what happens when the enemy leaves? They leave all the riches behind, don't they? So she, God judges, the enemy takes off, and those who are there spoil. They get all the riches that are left behind. Yeah, that's, that's one of the benefits of war, <laughs> if you're the one who stays when everyone else leaves. Through, uh, though ye be aligned among the pots, yet ye shall be as the, the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. You know, you might not understand all that, but don't you see a, a Holy Spirit here glorifying the nation of Israel? I mean, we got gold and feathers and, and birds like this. This is, this is glory coming to the nation of Israel. The enemy driven out, Israel going to be glorified. When the Almighty scattereth kings in it, it, uh, it was white as, as, as Salem. The hill of God is the hill of Bashan, a high hill as the hill of Bashan. You know, the hill of God is high. Listen to what it says. Why leap ye, ye high hills? This is the hill which God desired to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. You know, where did God desire to set up his throne? Jerusalem. You know, there's a hill in Jerusalem that's very high that God, he wants, God wants to put his throne. Same place David put his throne. It's the throne on Zion. The high hill is the Lord. Jesus Christ is coming back and he's going to place his hill, his throne on the hills of Jerusalem, on the hill of Zion. He's going to reign over this earth. So you see him scattering the enemy and setting up his kingdom on the earth. Uh, verse 18 now, uh, verse 17 says, The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. That's the second coming of Christ. The Lord is among them at Sinai in his holy place. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast uh, led captivity captive. Thou hast given, received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord might dwell among them. Israel was rebellious. God is coming back to save them. And you know what he's going to do? 
He's going to set up his throne on the high hills of Jerusalem, and from that ascended position, he takes and he wipes out the enemy. He leads captivity captive, takes the enemy and leads them away to imprisonment, and then takes the blessings that are there and glorifies the nation of Israel with the blessings. That's the second coming passage of what, what it means to lead captivity captive to, physical, to the physical kingdom that's on earth. Now, Paul took that same phrase and said when Jesus Christ ascended far above all, not just the heavens, when he got up here, we realized wrath didn't come. He ascended up to far above all heavens. And when he did that, he led captivity captive. What did he do? Well, watch this and we'll all come together. Come to Psalms chapter, uh, no, Colossians chapter 2. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. It says in verse 13, what an amazing statement if you understand exactly what he's saying. Colossians 2.13, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, that is, God quickened us with Christ, having forgiven you all trespasses. Uh, I break into Colossians 2 there in verse 13, and when it says, and you, you know what it's talking about? God was going to do all this through the nation of Israel, save the nation of Israel. You know what Colossians is all about? It's God saving you who was uncircumcised in heart. Gentiles who were really in Satan's domain. Satan ruled over us. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, who walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. You know what it was? Satan had us, the nations. He had us Gentiles. We were his property. He was after Israel too. From the far off above position, Jesus Christ reached down and he saved us Gentiles according to the dispensation of the grace of God given to the Apostle Paul to us. God saved us Gentiles by his grace and, and, and forgiven us all trespasses. He put that away. Verse 14 says, blotting out handwriting of, of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. The law that kept condemning us, not only did he save us and forgive us, he took the law away so there's nothing to condemn us anymore. Then it says in verse 15, and hath spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, in the cross. You know, when Jesus Christ died on that cross, there was a spiritual battle that was being fought, his complete victory over Satan. Satan's victory in this world was through you and I, who were Gentiles. Through that cross, God goes back and saves us Gentiles, and what did he do? He spoiled principalities and powers. He took Satan, who was over trying to take over this world, and he spoiled all of his power because the cross is the power to save all who believe. And there's no more power left in Satan. He's been spoiled. And you know what Jesus Christ did? He took those, those demonic powers, he beat them at the cross, and he led captivity captive. He took them captive for himself and led them away. You know where they are now? They're not on earth anymore. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in heavenly places. And when you get over here into the wrath of God, he's going to cast them to earth, and then cast them to a lake of fire, they're gone. When it says, when I, when I, when I read that phrase where Paul says that he ascended above all, that he might fill all things, that has to do with my salvation and the body of Christ. And in order for me to walk worthy, he has done something. He, he led captivity captive. He spoiled, he, he took the victory and the power of Satan and he robbed them of it. And then he turned around and he gave gifts to men. Can you imagine us who were empowered by Satan, indwelled by the, 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 the evil one, now he leads them away, they no longer influence us that way, and then he turns around and empowers us with his Holy Spirit so that we could walk worthy for him. That's what I think it means when he led captivity captive. That the cross was such a complete way that Satan and his forces are, are defeated. They're in retreat 
nation that are going into captivity. And in the meantime, while, while he's freed us from, from their rule over us, he's also given us gifts that we might grow and not be fooled to serve Satan any longer, that we might walk worthy unto the Lord, unto all pleasing. And I believe that's totally in line with what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 and what Paul's going to instruct us in Ephesians chapter 6. And I believe that the victory of the cross is that he spoiled the devil. And when, when he comes back and he, and he drives the enemy out of Israel's land, there Israel's left to take all the riches and the spoil and be blessed with it. Well, everything that Satan, all the power that Satan had, he's driven out so that you and I can be blessed with all the things that he had. You know what he had? Well, not only he had power on earth, he had power in heaven. And someday, we're going to be blessed with all spiritual blessings. We are now, aren't we? <laughs> Excuse me. Blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Satan's been robbed, and we're the beneficiary of all that he had that's now given to us. We're inheritors, and our inheritance is in heavenly places. And, uh, and it's all because of what Jesus Christ did. Spoil the devil, so we don't have to worry about him now. Then he's going to empower us. We'll be able to walk worthy before him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truths of your word. Whether it has to do with where the souls of, of the saints are, we know for a fact that they're in the presence of God in heaven. And Father, if we were to die, we know by faith that we'd be absent from the body and, and in your presence, waiting to receive a glorified body. But Father, help us to realize that what you accomplished on the cross frees us from Satan's dominion over us right now so that we might be free now to start serving you and actually spoil the enemy. That rather than, than serving the devil, we can actually take the gospel of reconciliation and bring more and more people into membership into the body of Christ and to fill the heavenly places with the glory of your Son. Father, help us to understand these truths and to walk worthy of the vocation that you've given us in Christ. Thank you for what we've understood and help us to understand what we don't. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, my Gary, were you going to go down the nursery? <laughs> we, we